we are going to get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next installment in the Anal Cancer Foundation's Expert Hour webinar series. Today's topic is anal cancer detection and prevention, and we are honored to be joined by Dr. Jessica Corman. I'm Justine Almada, and I'm a co-founder and the executive director of the Anal Cancer Foundation. I will moderate today's event, and I'm so thrilled that you have all joined us today. The purpose of today's webinar is to discuss anal cancer signs and symptoms. We are asked all the time, when is a hemorrhoid not a hemorrhoid? And what is the proper process to get checked out? Today, Dr. Corman will reinforce the importance of a digital rectal exam and a high resolution endoscopy. Tell us what those are, as well as how they should be performed. She will share exciting and emerging research on anal precancer, and she will discuss the HPV vaccine and its role in helping us end anal cancer for the next generation. Most importantly, our community always asks phenomenal questions. And after the presentation, there will be a live Q&A with Dr. Corman. We created the Expert Hour webinar series so that our patient community could hear directly from and ask questions of experts in the field. As my own family experienced when our mom was diagnosed with anal cancer, it's really tough to find high quality information. And we are committed to changing that by bringing the experts to you. I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to an anonymous donor who understands this challenge and whose generous support makes these webinars possible. Thank you so much. I invite you to check out our previous webinars on YouTube. Our most recent include Introduction to Clinical Trials and Immunotherapy 101, and this webinar will also be posted on that channel. Today, we are thrilled to present Dr. Jessica Corman as our latest expert. Dr. Corman is a gastroenterologist at Capital Digestive Care in Washington, DC. She is a leader in anal cancer, helping to lead the charge to detect anal cancer early through her clinical work as an early adopter of HRA and investigator on the ANCHOR trial, as well as her advocacy work within medical societies for better care for anal cancer. I also hear and have no doubt that she is a wonderful doctor. Dr. Corman has been consistently named a top doctor by her peers in Washingtonian magazine. Anal cancer is not routinely screened for. I've been honored to work with Dr. Corman to change that as we advocate for a standard screen for anal cancer. Again, after the presentation, there will be a Q&A with Dr. Corman. Please put any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Corman, please take it away. So happy to see everybody today. Um, as Justine mentioned, first of all, thank you for inviting me and having me. It's truly an honor. Um, we're going to talk today about anal cancer detection and prevention. My disclosures are that I receive grant support from NIH and the National Cancer Institute through the AIDS Malignancy Consortium for the Anchor Study. I'm a consultant for Pfizer, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Janssen. So first, we're going to talk about anal cancer detection, anal cancer signs and symptoms, how to determine what's anal cancer versus a hemorrhoid, how to detect anal cancer, which includes digital anal rectal exams and high resolution anoscopy, and how to find a provider who knows what they're doing. So first, I want to start with some anatomy so that everyone can understand what we're talking about. Although we all have anuses, not everybody knows what they look like on the inside. Um, so the rectum and the anus are connected, although in traditional medicine, we separate the rectum and the anus. They are indeed connected. And um, so you can see the arrows are pointing to the rectum. Then you can see pelvic floor muscles on the side. And there's another arrow pointing to the anal canal, which actually is about five inches long and extends into uh, the rectum, as well as the sphincter muscles, of which there are two anal sphincter muscles. One is under our control uh, consciously, and the other one is an involuntary muscle. So anal cancer signs and symptoms. Uh, there can be many, uh, but most commonly there is rectal bleeding, anal or rectal pain, um, discharge, 
itching in that area, pressure or a full feeling, constantly feeling the need to move your bowels, a mass or a bump or a nodule, any kind of lump bump in the anal area on the outside, but also on the inside, um, inside the anal canal up into the rectum, difficulty moving one's bowels, sort of a constipated feeling and sometimes even incontinence of stool. Um, and when anal cancer has spread, it first goes to the lymph nodes in the groin. So some people don't notice it until they notice enlarged um, lymph nodes in their groin, right where the thigh meets, um, meets your abdomen. So when is a hemorrhoid not a hemorrhoid? Well, sometimes they can seem like the same thing and it's not uncommon. Unfortunately, and I've seen this in my own patients that doctors will tell their patients, oh no, it's just a hemorrhoid, don't worry about it. And it's not. So it's important to be aware of what the difference is. So with anal cancer, you can have rectal bleeding. Also with hemorrhoids, you can have pain with anal cancer. Hemorrhoid pain is only external. Internal hemorrhoids are not painful. So unless you also have an anal fissure, which is a tear in the skin covering the anal canal, um, internal hemorrhoids are not painful. So if you have pain internally and someone tells you it's hemorrhoids, that's incorrect. Um, an irregular mass or nodule, it is not smooth. Uh, it can be lumpy and bumpy. Um, and hemorrhoids externally are smooth. And often people will say it feels like a, a size of a grape or a pea, and sometimes they're hard, but they're always smooth. They can also be tender to the touch, but they're never irregular feeling. And most importantly, anal cancer doesn't go away on its own. So if there's a, this, these types of symptoms and they last for more than three or four weeks, it is definitely not a hemorrhoid. Um, hemorrhoids eventually will resolve either on their own or with treatment, they shrink and get softer. So just to, again, to review side by side the anatomy, you'll see on the left side of your screen um, is a cartoon of anal cancer that I did not draw and I couldn't find one that sho also shows other locations that anal cancer be it, can be in. So I put little turquoise circles around them. So the top turquoise circle is actually the most common place to develop anal cancer, which is what's called the anal transition zone and also known as the squamocolumnar junction. And that's where the rectal cells and the squamous cells meet. The colon is lined by columnar cells and the anus is lined by squamous cells. HPV does not have the ability to infect columnar cells. That is why anal cancer and rectal cancer are not necessarily the same thing. Um, if it's a squamous cancer, it is anal. Um, and also anal cancer can be on what we call the perianal skin. So basically on the outside or right at the opening. Um, and then on the right side of your screen is a cartoon of hemorrhoids. They are basically dilated blood vessels that come about from either prolonged sitting, sometimes prolonged travel, straining, pushing, sitting for long times, long periods of time on the commode. Lots of people like to read on the commode. So that is what leads to internal hemorrhoids, also childbearing. So um, when someone with a uterus pushes, a baby out for hours and hours, You most of them develop some type of hemorrhoid. But again, internal hemorrhoids do not hurt. Now they can prolapse so they can pop out um, and those can be tender and painful. But again, usually you can push them back in and eventually they should shrink down. So how do we detect anal cancer? So we call it the DARE, although most people call it a DRE or digital rectal exam. Uh, the Anal Cancer Foundation and the International Anal Neoplasia Society have started to call it the DARE, which is the Digital Anal Rectal Examination. And that's because a lot of people, when they do a rectal exam, they just put their finger in, maybe swirl it around a little bit, and then take it out. And they don't really do a very good examination of the anal canal. So you will miss things that are in that canal region. You might feel something at the end of the rectum. You might see something on the outside, but you're might miss something in the canal. So we think it's very important to make sure you do a thorough examination. Um, and again, we're examining the anus and the end of the rectum using a glove finger and lubricant. 
So how is it done? It takes about a minute. Uh, you will feel a pressure-like sensation. Sometimes it makes people feel as if they have to move their bowels. Um, it is generally not painful. It can be uncomfortable, but sometimes it is painful if there is an anal fissure. Again, that's a tear in the skin um, or a mass, like a possible cancer. Those are quite tender, and some patients with um, cancer cannot uh, tolerate even um, a rectal exam or a digital anal rectal exam, a DARE. Cancer feels irregular, it's not smooth, and it's usually hard, and it's often tender. Um, if, if you find the DARE to be painful, most providers will have some kind of numbing lubricant like lidocaine jelly, not always, but it, most gastroenterologists and surgeons uh, and uh, gynecologists will have lidocaine jelly available. And that they can sort of put on the area, let it sit for a little bit till it's more numb to try to do a better exam. So even occasionally that exam has to be done under sedation. Um, but it's important that it gets done if you have an issue there that's not um, resolving on its own. So the people who do this exam can just be regular providers. Um, every, any provider should be able to do a digital anal rectal exam but specifically skilled providers would be colorectal surgeons, gastroenterologists, gynecologists traditionally, um, who in their, I don't know if they're still being taught now because I'm not a gynecologist, but they used to be taught to do both a vaginal exam and a rectal exam often at the same time to understand um, if there's any process happening between the rectal wall and the vaginal wall. So they also do rectal exams or they should be. Um, as well as HRA providers. And we'll talk more about who are HRA providers um, a little later. That again, HRA stands for high resolution anoscopy, which I'll refer to as HRA going forward. The other important thing is to ask for a chaperone in the room if you would feel more comfortable. It's important that um, if you don't feel comfortable with the provider or just as a routine standard, you should be asked if you want a chaperone and you should advocate for a chaperone if you'd like one there. So HRA can detect both cancer and precancer. Um, and again, precancer are um, high grade cells that are um, caused by high risk HPV. Um, and it's a procedure where a provider uses an anoscope, which is a thin clear plastic tube. Um, and uh, it's usually, uh, four or five inches long. It's about an inch, a little over an inch around, sometimes a little bigger. Um, numbing jelly, acetic acid, which is the same thing as household white vinegar, Lugol solution, which is an iodine solution, and a magnifying instrument to look at the anal canal. So this is kind of a sort of a way to look at it. Um, so basically the provider will insert an anoscope that's been lubricated. We typically will numb the anal canal with some lubricating jelly, numbing lubricating jelly beforehand. Prior to that, we usually do an anal swab, which is an anal pap smear, or technically it's called an anal cytology, but it's a sampling of the cells of the anal canal. Um, and most of us also will test for high-risk HPV at the same time. Then an anoscope is inserted. Um, the anoscope has an obturator in it, which is an internal part um, that we take out. And then through the anoscope, we put a gauze that's been soaked in vinegar. Then we take out the anoscope, let the vinegar sit for a few minutes. Um, then we take that out and then we look with, an, with, a, um, with the scope, which there are lots of different kinds of scopes. Uh, gynecologists will call it a colposcope. Um, some people will call it, you know, there's a high resolution anoscope. There's lots of ways to call, lots of things to call it, but basically it's an instrument where the provider looks through the, the uh, lens pieces, aims it at the um, anal opening and usually examines, some people do it in different ways, first on the outside, then on the inside with the anoscope. Some people do first on the inside with the anoscope and then the outside. So the HRA takes about 10 to 20 minutes. It's uncomfortable, but usually well tolerated. It's not typically painful. A lot of providers will provide, if someone uh, needs 
something to relax. Some providers will uh, pre-medicate patients with some oral relaxation medications if they have a hard time tolerating the exam. And usually we can work something out to make it um, as comfortable as possible. The provider is looking for pre-cancer usually, cancer um, if suspected. Um, it's also used to detect pre-cancer in someone who's already had anal cancer. So in order to pre prevent recurrence, we wanna find those HCL cells, those precancerous cells and treat them to prevent recurrence. Providers can be general practitioners, uh, infectious disease specialists, gynecologists, colorectal surgeons, gastroenterologists, and also include both physicians and advanced practice providers who that includes um, um, nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So how to find a provider, it is not that easy. Uh, but seek care if, if concerned. Uh, the important thing is to request a digital anal rectal exam if they cannot come up with someone to refer you to who does high resolution anoscopy because the DARE can be done with anybody with a finger. Um, HRA is performed by a specialist. So it's important to know who you're looking for. Questions to ask a particular provider that says that they provide HRA is how did you train? Did you learn it in a three hour course at some, you know, medical meeting or did you take the Ian's course, uh, which is a, a, a several day course as well as there's an advanced practice, an advanced provider course and ongoing uh, training. I would also, I didn't put this on this slide, but I would also ask if they're members of the International Anal Neoplasia Society because all the very experienced HRA providers do belong to Ian's. Um, so it's important to know that too. And you can reach out to Ian's to see if they are affiliated. Um, and you wanna ask them, how long have you been providing HRA? How many HRAs do you do in a week? So you wanna know that they really have the experience and the volume to know what they're doing. Of course, if you live in an area that it does not have an, uh, a lot of HRA providers or may have somebody who's new to doing HRA and that's your only choice, that's okay too. It's important to see whoever you can. Um, but if you have an, a more advanced um, and seasoned practitioner in your area, I would seek out the more um, advanced and seasoned practitioner. Uh, so ask your primary care provider for a referral. Again, if an HRA provider is not found that you can go to, to either a colorectal surgeon or gastroenterologist to evaluate and potentially biopsy a worrisome area. So outside of the office, if, for example, someone does not tolerate um, an exam in the office or needs a biopsy or a more careful examination, gastroenterologists have the option of doing a flexible sigmoidoscopy to look at that area, So you'll, which would be done either awake or under sedation to look with a different kind of scope at the um, end of the rectum and the anal canal. And colorectal surgeons can do an exam under anesthesia as well um, to look at the anal canal. In addition, you can access the UCSF Anal Cancer Information website, as well as the International Anal Neoplasia website. And of course, our beloved Anal Cancer Foundation can also get you in touch with providers. So part two, hope for the future, preventing progression of precancer to cancer. So I'm gonna talk about the Anchorage study and the key findings and next steps, as well as how to detect anal precancer or high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, as we talked about. So the Anchor study stands for Anal Cancer H, H Cell Outcomes Research. And this is a study that is sponsored by NIH, uh, the National Cancer Institute and the AIDS Malignancy Consortium. Um, we have screened 10,732 HIV positive individuals. 4,459 participants were found to have HCIL. That's how you um, tested into the study. And then those folks were randomized to either treatment or active monitoring. So half of the group was treated every six months as needed, or they were monitored closely every three to six months um, to make sure that they were not progressing to anal cancer. So how did we follow people? We did, as I said, HRA every six months. Some people had it more frequently if we were particularly worried about their precancer 
in other words, if it seemed more aggressive or worrisome. Um, and we also took anal swabs, lots of anal swabs, and we continued to actually do this even though the study is closed to new participants, um, as well as biopsies. So we have tissue and all kinds of different um, biologic data that we've collected and is banked um, in a what's called a biobank. Then uh, the folks who are in the treatment arm were treated and the majority of uh, individuals in the study were treated with a hyfricator, which is a tool that basically burns off the abnormal cells. So we use electrocautery to burn off those cells. There were a few other treatment options. Most people don't use other treatment options. Some people, we'll talk about in a second, um, use uh, various topical creams. Uh, but um, in the study, most people used a hyfrication. So the trial was halted ahead of schedule in October of 2021 as early treatment was demonstrated to have a clear benefit. This was very exciting and continues to be very exciting news. Uh, and the risk was reduced by 57%. So for people in the treatment arm, their risk was lowered by 57% over about 48 months. Now, everyone in the study came in at different times. So the amount of time that people were studied was variable. Some people for more than five years, some people for much shorter. The average was about 48 months, um, which is when we saw this reduction. So you could consider that maybe if the if we followed people for even longer, they'd be potentially be even a, more of a reduced risk, but I can't say that for sure. Um, and there were very few adverse events related to um, any of the study procedures. And based on the results, guide not, guidelines are now under discussion. So a big thank you to NIH, uh, National Cancer Institute and the AIDS Malignancy Consortium for um, paying for this pivotal, pivotal trial. So what are the next steps? We have to determine how to apply these results to other at-risk populations. Uh, we need to train more HRA providers. There aren't that many of us, and we need more if we're going to be screening a lot of people. We need to develop guidelines, and we need to do further studies on biological samples collected from the anchor study to understand what factors, molecular, mostly we're thinking molecular factors or factors associated with H, certain strains of HPV virus, or, or could it be host factors? We're looking at that now. Uh, may increase the risk for development of cancer. So how do, we, how do we identify who's at the highest risk versus who we could maybe screen less intensively? And we need to raise awareness. So how to detect and treat anal precancer? Uh, of course, we use high resolution anoscopy and the anal pap smear we do do, um, but it's not as accurate as we would like it to be. So that's kind of a problem. It's not, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how to utilize the anal pap smear. We also, uh, a lot of us use high-risk anal HPV testing to determine risk as they do in the cervix. But right now, um, the high-risk HPV test in the anal canal is not, it is not FDA approved for use in the anal canal. So it is off-label use. Although at least in the Washington DC area, um, all, every insurance company, including Medicare is paying for that. Um, so it's covered. If HCL is found, um, as I said or alluded to earlier, it's most commonly treated with electrocautery, such as hyfrication, which is a little office electrocautery tool, but also sometimes it's treated by excision under anesthesia by a surgeon, topical therapy, which means creams. Uh, we use 5-fluorouracil, which is actually a chemotherapy agent, but in a, in a cream form. So it basically works on the area that you're putting it on. And some people use amiquimod, but I will say uh, I don't find amiquimod at all effective. I don't even find it very effective against warts, which are low risk HPV. So I don't know very many people who use amiquimod and actually I would recommend against it. But 5-fluorouracil can be used to help reduce the size of uh, HCL if there's a lot of it, which might make then subsequent treatment more comfortable. Um, as a standalone treatment, uh, that has not been studied as a, as a single treatment, but, but people use it here and there. Um, Follow-up is initially frequent, typically every six months, sometimes shorter if we're very concerned, and then extended uh, to less frequently depending on what's found at each visit. So 
H cell unfortunately recurs. Uh, eventually we can get it under control usually, um, but it may take a long time. So again, it depends what we find each time and we sort of vary when we bring folks back based on their uh, often their high risk HPV status and what we find when we do HRA. So part three, HPV related cancers and preventing HPV related cancers for the next generation. We'll talk a little bit about HPV related cancer epidemiology, the HPV vaccine and uh, the difference that this vaccine is making. So I'm gonna throw up some slides which are not perfect in the sense that our knowledge is not perfect at all. But this slide um, comes from actually anchor study, uh, a slide deck from the anchor study. So it doesn't have every single group in it, but the point of it is to show that the annual incidence of these cancers per 100,000 is interesting when you think about it. So the highest risk group uh, are um, HIV positive, men who have sex with men, um, that is on par with the risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer, which is enormous. Uh, those, that's the second most common cancer in the United States. Um, and also people living with HIV who are female, um, it's high. Uh, men who have sex with men who are HIV negative, it's high, 35. Um, and that's on par with how cervical, the rates of cervical cancer in the 1940s, since we started doing cervical cancer screening with cervical pap smears and colposcopy to treat cervical precancers, that rate has gone down dramatically. Um, and people who have anal cancer who are not living with HIV, it's about two per 100,000 annually in the United States. Um, again, these numbers are from the United States. So a lot of them, again, are on par with the big cancers, colon, lung, breast, and prostate. So um, it's important that we look out for this. This is another slide, uh, which is called the Clifford uh, graph. Um, he compiled data from various studies, um, some of which are have uh, better data than others, to try to estimate people's risk based on certain categories. So again, on the left, you can see the people living with HIV um, who are men who have sex with men are at the highest risk, um, even at a surprisingly young age, between 30 and 44. Uh, also in women, women who've had vulvar cancer and vulvar precancer, so high grade vulvar changes uh, that have been treated as well as um, women who are 10 years out from having a solid organ transplant. There's sort of another tier of folks who are HIV, people living with HIV who are not men who have sex with men, um, HIV negative men who have sex with men, um, although that number we don't really know, along with women who are not living with HIV who don't have any other obvious risk factors. Um, <clears throat> Women living with HIV are also at increased risk. And then there's a group of also vaginal cancer, vaginal precancer, cervical cancer if you're over 60, and people who are on medications uh, for autoimmune diseases who are immune suppressed, such as lupus, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease, uh, where we don't have a ton of data, to be perfectly honest. Hopefully more to come. Over 90% of anal cancer is caused by the high risk type of HPV. The most common strains, of course, and the highest risk strains are, are uh, HPV 16 and 18, along with several others, but those are the two highest risk. Um, it is very, HPV is a very common virus. There are over a hundred strains affecting 80% of the population. That's probably an underestimate. Pretty much everybody's been exposed to HPV and either the body controls it or it doesn't and your body can go in and out of controlling the virus. HPV associated cancers include anal, cervical, head and neck, vulvar, vaginal, and penile cancer. Um, HPV related cancers, including anal cancer on the rise. Part of this is because there's a long progression time and we have no screening guidelines right now or, or and some of them not even a screening mechanism for five of those six cancers. Although rates of cervical cancer are now low, what is very also scary is there's been an increase in metastatic cervical cancer, which is probably due to a lack of access and not enough screening. So 
maybe living in an area that's underserved where you don't have access to screening, being uninsured or out of the out of the healthcare loop, um, or providers for whatever reason may not be recommending screening. Another way to look at this, um, I didn't include cervical cancer on this slide. This comes from the SEER database, which is a national database. Um, you can sort of see uh, how many cases there are per year in the United States uh, related to HPV. So vagina, not so common. And only 75, well, I should say 879 total, but 700 expected to be related to HPV. About 75% of vaginal cancer is caught related to HPV. Vulvar cancer, about 4,200 per year, about 70% related to HPV. Penile cancer, very uncommon, th about 13, 1,400 cases, 63% associated with HPV. So that comes to about 900 cases a year. And then we have the anus. These numbers are, I think, old. Now we're probably around 9,000-ish number of cases per year, but just estimate 91% of that is going to be related to HPV. And of course, more women than men will um, acquire uh, anal cancer um, over time and per year. And then the other scary number is the oropharynx, um, which is 20,839 cases a year. 70% are estimated to be associated with HPV. And we have absolutely no way of screening for it. So HPV vaccine, right? What are we gonna do for the future generations? We have a vaccine that can prevent cancer. So, so what are the guidelines? Um, the World Health Organization uh, says out of 125 countries, 64% have introduced the HPV vaccine in their national immunization program for girls and 47%, sorry, 24% of these countries. So. Uh, 47 countries are also recommending the HPV vaccine for boys. In the United States, the HPV vaccine is recommended for all children um, ages 11 to 12, and catch-up vaccines are also recommended. Keep in mind, you can give the HPV vaccine as soon as nine years old. Um, in the United Kingdom, all year eight children, which is 12 to 13 years old, are recommended to obtain the HPV vaccine. There are also similar guidelines in Australia. I'm not sure about all the other countries. Those are the ones I'm most familiar with. And in both the US and the UK, the vaccine is available um, with discussion with your provider and, uh, for special populations up until the age of 45. A lot of um, gynecologists are telling their uh, patients who've had cervical, vaginal, or vulvar cancer to get the HPV vaccine. So there's a little bit of data that it might help prevent recurrence, but not a lot of data, and it's not that solid, but you know, it's a vaccine, so it's unlikely to harm. Um, and in the US, the vaccine is FDA approved up until age 45. Getting insurance to cover it at that age is, a, is another story. The HPV vaccine is making a difference. We are seeing a reduction in HPV precancers in locations with high vaccination rates. Although keep in mind, only women have been studied as a population. This has not been studied in men. Um, and the HPV vaccine has resulted in the UK an 87% reduction in cervical cancer and a 97% reduction in cervical precancer in women in their 20s. In Australia, a 70% reduction of cervical precancer in women under 20. And in the US, a 71% reduction in HPV in women in their 20s. So in summary, the HPV vaccine is our best shot at preventing anal cancer, yet, HPV-related cancers are increasing due to long progression time. Therefore, we have to have a multi-pronged approach to find anal precancer and anal cancer. If you have signs and symptoms, please see an HRA provider, your own provider, or a gastroenterologist, colorectal surgeon, maybe even a gynecologist, anyone who's willing to do a digital anal rectal exam, ideally an HRA provider, but um, anyone will do as long as they're willing to to look. Um, they will look for anal cancer or precancer utilizing a DARE, uh, HRA, or maybe even other modalities. And thank you. It's time for questions. Hello. Thank you so much, Dr. Corman. That was super informative and super clear. 
I'm going to ask a question that came up for me while, while we were watching, while I was watching you, the anchor study is so exciting, right? This is like, it's, um, this is an amazing study. So many people were involved in making this happen. Um, and one of the things that I always find most powerful about the study is that it told us that we can prevent progression to anal cancer if we find it in that precancerous stage. Um, and the number that, that was found in the study was 57%, which is such a stunning number, right? Over how we can prevent over half of them from progressing. Do you think we could get that, that number could get even higher with more training of more providers? Uh, I absolutely think so. I mean, I think first of all, uh, a lot of the people who, you know, we're going to at some point be publishing more specific uh, descriptive uh, reports about who developed cancer in the study because people develop cancer in both arms of the study, the treatment arm and the monitoring arm. Treatment is not perfect. So we'll try to come up with some descriptive information to help people understand why one would develop, continue on to get anal cancer despite treatment. So that's complicated. Um, But I do think um, we can get that number a lot higher. I think that if people stay in screening for a long period of time, and start screening earlier, then we shouldn't get that far. Um, I really think we can get those numbers up, but we do also need more HRA providers who are better trained because not every HRA provider is the same. So some people have more experience. Some people are, you know, it's just like any provider, some, you know, We're not all on the same par, unfortunately, but if we can hopefully standardize training and and we do have published metrics um, about uh, what your standards should, what kind of standards you should be up to, um, we should move in that direction of more than 57% reduction. I really, I really think that is true. It's amazing. It's so exciting. Yeah. Um, I really, and to that last point about providers, I really appreciated the questions that you put forth that people should ask because it's something we get asked a lot. Um, So on that, one of the questions that came in from the audience is, you know, what should someone do if they have high-risk HPV, but they live in a city that has no doctors that they've been able to find to perform HRA? and there aren't, there don't seem to be cities nearby either. That is definitely a tough one. Um, That's a great uh, question. I wish I could give an easy answer for this, but I don't have one. What I would say is probably try to find a provider who's willing to do an annual DARE. So an annual annual digital anal rectal exam to, hopefully be able to find something early uh, that if something develops. Now, remember, not everybody with high-risk HPV and even anal precancer is going to develop anal cancer. This is not like a foregone conclusion. Lots of people have high-risk HPV. Lots of people, I mean, we don't really know the true incidence, but for example, we screened 10,000 people living with HIV. 4,500 of them had high-risk lesion, so high re- high grade precancer. Um, that number is much lower outside of people living with HIV. I mean, much, much, much lower. Um, so the progression rate is not 100%. That said, I think the best you can really do is find someone to do a very thorough and careful digital anal rectal exam. Uh, maybe even if you can find a surgeon, uh, maybe a colorectal surgeon who will do an anoscopy annually, just a standard anoscopy. So they just take that, uh, the, the anoscope and look with a light and just a smidge of magnification, but they don't usually use vinegar or Lugol's to try to just make sure there are no obvious little nodules or something that's growing because anal cancer when caught early is highly treatable. Granted, nobody wants to go through treatment for anal cancer because it's terrible. Thank you. If your anal and cervical paps are negative after having anal cancer, is it still possible to get recurrences or second HPV cancers? 
what should folks do um, who have had anal cancer and are like concerned about these secondary cancers? So the protocol that most of us use, um, at least uh, from Ian's um, and the American HRA community, um, the first year after the diagnosis of anal cancer, the, the, um, the guidelines from the oncologist are to do a, an anoscopy every three months, but they just say anoscopy. So a lot of people are sent to a colorectal surgeon to be followed. If you can find an HRA provider, that's even better. So on my patients who've had anal cancer for the first year after treatment, I do an HRA every three months for the first year. Then we do an HRA every six months. And then up until the fifth year, the, the risk of recurrence after, the after year five is exceedingly low. So then we go to annual exams. And after year 10, I don't, I'm not sure uh, how to continue from there. There's no consensus on that, but the risk is extremely low. I think that anyone who's had an anal cancer should continue to have cervical cancer, uh, vaginal and vulvar exams as well, um, annually, actually. Now the gynecologists are not all willing to do annual cervical pap smears for women over a particular age because ACOG, which is the American College of Gynecologists, does not recommend it. But there's no guideline for this specific subset of individuals. So I look for gynecologists who are willing to be more aggressive because um, anal HPV is very close. The anus is very close to the vulva. So that's also an important, someone should do a visual inspection of the vulva. Not everyone is willing to do it. Regarding head and neck cancers, there is no screening. Um, you can ask your dentist. I mean, since I have my nose right next to people's uh, HPV and anuses all the time, I ask my dentist every time I go for a cleaning to please look in my mouth and see if there are any funky lumps or bumps or anything that looks irregular. And they do it. I mean, most de dentists should be doing, or the hygienist does an exam. They examine your tongue. They feel the lymph nodes. Um, that's what they should be doing. And that's a good way of, you know, at least looking in the oral cavity. So the oropharyngeal cancers, which is like throat cancer, um, Again, there is no test. Now, if there's already a cancer, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, an ENT, can take uh, what's called a laryngoscope, which is a very, very skinny scope. They just, and they do it in the office awake. Um, they'll numb your nasal passage with some jelly or spray. And then they pass that scope up your nose and they look in the back of your throat. So they can see things that way. So what I tell my patients and what I'll tell you today is if you, have a sore throat lasting for more than three to four weeks. If you have swollen lymph nodes anywhere in this area um, that lasts more than three or four weeks, make an appointment to see an ear, nose and throat doctor and demand that they do a laryngoscopy so that they look in your back of your throat. And if they can't figure out what's going on with these lymph nodes and they, you know, don't biopsy it, they should do a CAT scan um, to look at these lymph nodes and see if they're um, suspicious in any way. So unfortunately, we don't have any great, I don't have anything good to say about oral, oral pharyngeal cancer prevention, except tell all the kids to get the vaccine and make all the parents get their kids the vaccine. We're getting questions on the vaccine as well. Okay. For, uh, and this is one that we get um, frequently, and I'm sure you do too, which is for people who are over 45 mm -hmm. and have had anal cancer, mm -hmm. should they get the vaccine? And mo most importantly, <laughs> could it be helpful to them for in right. terms of recurrence? So we don't know. I mean, it has not been studied thoroughly. So... I don't know the answer to that, but my view of HPV vaccines um, is that why not? Uh, you know, if it has the potential to prevent recurrence, super. Uh, the main downside is potentially finding someone to give it to you because a lot of people won't. Um, and paying for it because insurance definitely will not cover 
for, I haven't seen it cover anyone's HPV vaccine over the age of 45. I even have trouble getting it for people over the age of 26 for them to cover it. Um, and it costs about for the um, HPV uh, nine vaccine, which is um, Gardasil, um, Gardasil nine, um, that runs up, about 150 to 200 dollars a shot and if you hear my dog barking in the background i'm sorry <laughs> so and it's a series of three shots so my view of course is that it won't hurt but it's not fda approved uh in people over the age of 45 so i have to say that um it hasn't been studied enough there is some well let me say this there is some data in cervical cancer that it may help prevent recurrence of cervical cancer. But it's not a big number of people that it was studied in. That data is not perfect. And we can't necessarily extend that to the anal canal cancers. Thank you. We are um, getting a couple questions from people who have recently finished treatment. So the first one is, how soon after treatment should I get the HRA? I just finished chemo radiation um had one lymph node lymph node not respond so i had removed it with surgery next last week um so really just kind of as a general for this person and as a general question when should they start looking at the hra after treatment so the first one should be three months uh after the completion of treatment and that one can be hard because the anal canal is still uh healing from the radiation, which as we know, is very, very rough um, and uncomfortable. So uh, that can be a tough one, but three months is what's recommended, three months after you complete therapy. Um, so ask your provider to use a lot of numbing lubricant. And a similar question, this person is way out. They are now almost 10 years out of treatment. Um, they've been successfully monitored and their question is, should they be having HRA periodically, annually, every few years? Um, is there a time frame for them? So I don't know, to be honest. Um, I've asked, uh, the people who know the most about, um, anal cancer in this country who are, uh, Joel Pilevsky, Naomi J, Steve Goldstone, the people who've been doing HRA the longest, what they think, and they don't give me, they, they don't give me a straight answer. So I don't really know. I would say probably it could be extended to every two years, maybe an anal pap smear with anal high risk HPV testing, co-testing at the same time, maybe, um, the risk again is very low. Um, so I think it's a discussion between you and your HRA provider, um, and what you're comfortable with, what they're comfortable with. It's sort of a, what we call shared decision-making point uh, where we have a conversation together and come up with what's right for you, but there are no guidelines. So I, I, it's a gray zone. And the reason for no guidelines is there hasn't been a ton of research, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so that's why they, it's not, there aren't clear guidelines on it yet. Um, Correct. I do. I do know people who have had anal cancer who are ten years out, who are still getting periodic HRAs. They're not so frequent anymore. Right. But they are still going every year, every two years to get an HRA. It is a, not an easy, always procedure, but it's a short procedure, and it's not. You know, it, it's it's if you're comfortable having it done, it gives you some peace of mind. I don't think that's a wrong thing to do. So you'll never regret checking. You might regret not checking. So I, I don't think there's anything incorrect about screening past 10 years. Thank you. We also get this, this question that I'm about to ask about HPV um, periodically. I was never tested for HPV yet had anal cancer. How do I know if the anal cancer I had was caused by HPV or if it's one of those 9% of non-HPV cases? So um, you should be able to uh, ask the, so it depends who took the biopsy of the cancer. So whoever took the biopsy of the cancer should be able to request for you HPV testing on the tissue from that cancer. They have to keep a block of the tissue. The pathologists keep a block 
for a long, long time. So if you can track down who removed it or where the patho where your tissue block is, which pathology office, department, hospital, um, if you track it down, you should be able to request, usually the provider who um, removed it can request, but you can ask your gynecologist or your gastroenterologist or whoever, colorectal surgeon to request that it be tested uh, for high risk HPV. Um, and they should be able to stand for that even years later. Thank you. Another HPV question, should high risk HPV be disclosed to a prospective partner before having sex, even before kissing because of the risk of transmission? A, um, so that's for high risk HPV. And we also get a different question um, at times, which is for people who have had anal cancer, or one of the other HPV cancers, can they be transmitting their HPV to their partner? So I get asked that a lot too. Um, I don't, I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer. I think since we know that pretty much everybody has had HPV and been exposed to HPV, I, I don't know that disclosing is going to make any difference because the person you're um, intimate with has already likely been exposed unless you're both very young um, or each other's first partners um, or early first partner, early first few. Um, and if it's a longtime partner, like you're sort of newly diagnosed with an HPV related cancer, you've already exposed, been exposed to each other's germs for as long as you've been together. So at that point, there's no reason to stop doing what you do. Um, I personally think that it's not necessary to disclose it. But what I do say is that if you, if this is someone that you're really, that you're either committed to or want to be in a long-term relationship with. It might make you feel better to disclose it so that they know about it, but you can also inform them that they have already probably had HPV in all the places where you can have it. So I, I'm, you know, I don't know what, I don't know how to answer this. It's not the same as having other infections uh, because it's so common. There's just a lot of common viruses, not all of them need to be disclosed. But this one is, again, a case-by-case -case basis. It's a personal decision. All right, the next question is, how effective is an antiscope versus the HRA itself? I can't really answer that because nobody's ever studied standard anoscopy versus high-resolution anoscopy for detecting uh, pre-cancer. Um, it should be able to see cancer for sure, an anoscope or standard anoscope, but precancer, I don't know. Um, there are three very, very, very old studies, which were like small case series from surgical practices where they were looking at rates of progression from precancer to cancer in their practice. That's the precancer that they could see, and they were not using high resolution anoscopy. So they were using a combination of just their the naked eye and a standard anoscope. Um, and the rates of progression uh, were not great. So high resolution anoscopy better, standard anoscopy not easy to see, very small, small precancer. I mean, for example, I also do colonoscopy because I'm a gastroenterologist. I can't always see precancer even on a colonoscopy where I can, you know, flip the scope around and look in the rectum at that sort of anorectal junction, that area right there where most cancers come. I can't always see that. I mean, I can see something that's big and developing. So I advocate, you know, that all gastroenterologists take a careful look at that area when they do a colonoscopy or flexible sigmoidoscopy as well as a good digital anorectal exam. Um, but it's not that e always so easy to see big things easier to see small things, not so much high resolution anoscopy is definitely better, but you have to make do with what you have. Unfortunately, again, hopefully we can train more providers going forward. We had a question too, about routine colonoscopy. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like I hear kind of both that sometimes people have anal cancer found on a colonoscopy. Sometimes they have a colonoscopy and it wasn't found. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it sounds like from what you're saying, it's not always the most effective, but it can find anal cancer. Is that correct? correct? 
Do we yeah, have I, numbers on that? Like, do we know? Okay. No, not at all. Um, it is taught that as part of a standard colonoscopy that you do a digital rectal exam and that you do what's called retroflexion to look backwards, but not, you know, again, not everybody is looking so hard. Um, colonoscopy though is not a great, I mean, it's designed to screen for colorectal cancer, which is not HPV related. So it's just not designed for this purpose. Um, that said, it can be detected in that fashion. And if you are having symptoms, it should be able to be diagnosed in that way. So for those who may not be in an area with an HRA provider, the colonoscopy is their only uh, source, perhaps, of screening. For screening? Yeah. That they, it sounds like they should go in and ask for a DARE and also ask for, what is the exact term for that looking back? Um, oh, retroflexion? Well, retroflexion. that's part of a colonoscopy. I mean, and that's a whole procedure. You're sedated. You have to prepare. That's a whole, it's not um, indicated for, for this purpose. But if you're having rectal bleeding or anorectal pain or discharge or, you know, all the scary symptoms that we talked about and it's not hemorrhoids or you're trying to differentiate between hemorrhoids and something else, then a colonoscopy can be used. Um, but... I think, I mean, I can't speak for all gastroenterologists, you know, it's not top of mind in the gastroenterology world, despite my efforts to make it top of mind, I'm working on it, but colorectal surgeons are also a very important research. They probably know more about anal cancer than gastroenterologists, to be perfectly honest. It's more part of their world on a regular basis than gastroenterology. I'm trying to make it more part of gastroenterology, but we're not quite there yet. So anyone that you can find that is willing to look, that's who you should go to. But for screening, I think if you have no access to an HRA provider, I would try to get a good digital anal rectal exam from someone, maybe in an anoscopy. I don't know. There's no data on that. So um, this one person is writing in that they have, there are no HRA providers, um, as we've as we've heard before, and they're hoping that there are new fully trained HRA providers um, that are up and coming, and that there are new ones being mentored. And there actually is a lot of progress being made on this, and you have been a big part of that. So if you could speak to that, and then the last question is, how can we get a list of HRA providers? Um, so to the person who's asking that, you can email us, info at analcancerfoundation.org, and we will send you all the links that um, Dr. Corman outlined. And then if you could just outline that too, um, as your final point as well, again. Sure. So yes, we are making more new HRA providers. Um, the, the International Anal Neoplasia Society gives uh, an HRA training course annually, I think now, is it twice a year or every year? I'm not sure. Um, now it's virtual, which is also making it easier for people to participate. I'm not sure that's good or bad uh, because in-person sometimes is also important, but it does allow us to have a wider reach and people from all over the world attend uh, from all different uh, specialties within healthcare. Um, and different providers, uh, advanced practice providers and physicians. Um, so that's really exciting. I mean, every year there are more and more people attending. That course has grown tremendously. So that's the best news. Um, and in terms of finding someone, I would agree with Justine to contact the Anal Cancer Foundation. You can also go to the International Anal Neoplasia Society website. And if you don't see a list at any of those websites, you can always, you know, click on one of those email us links and just email whoever and say, listen, I'm trying to find an HRA provider near me. This is where I live. Can you help me? The Anal Cancer Foundation and Ian's definitely have the resources to connect you because particularly Ian's knows who has, who's a member of Ian's, who's attended the course, that's, I think, your best bet. You can also Google high-resolution anoscopy and your area. <laughs> to be honest, sometimes you can find people that way who at least might have some basic knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today and for answering all of these questions and for um, 
your great and super clear presentation. I want to thank all of the thrivers who joined us and asked great questions. And um, to all of our patients who inform our content all the time, a lot of the questions that came up today are questions we get asked a lot. So this content will be available. We have recorded it. So it will be available on our YouTube channel. And um, if you have any other questions that you feel like weren't answered today, like feel free to email us info at analcancerfoundation.org. Um, I do want to thank the anonymous supporter who made this event possible. Finally, we're always looking for new ideas for future topics. So please, please let us know. We want to hear from you. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. And Dr. Corman, is there anything else that you want to add before we sign off? No, I'm just so happy to have been invited. And for everybody who's listening, thank you for attending and spread the word. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.